Hey, what's up with daylight savings? It's like fucking 6 p.m. and I can't see shit outside. What's the point of this shit anyway? Put the clocks forward a few hours? I get a few more minutes of sleep? I get to dream about bullshit a little longer, oh boy. I don't wanna do that shit. No one wants to do that shit. I wanna get up and at them. I wanna enjoy my bowl of frosted flakes. You know, I don't live in a particularly suburban area. In fact, it's quite urban, so there aren't a lot of lights in my neighborhood, let alone people with no melanin in their skin. And the headlights on my car are broken, because my car is old. Everything on my dash is like, cracked, and there's like fucking bugs living in the glove compartment, it's fucking gross. When I'm driving at like 6 p.m., I can barely see two feet in front of me. I'm just trying to drive to GameStop to get the new monkey ball in my hand-me-down car from 2001, but I can't see where I'm going. It's like Sonic Genesis. And I don't mean Sega Genesis. I mean Sonic Genesis. On Game Boy Advance. There's nothing advanced about this. I can't see! Yeah, speaking of 2001 and the Game Boy Advance, Dismemberment Plan released a pretty okay album that year. Robot Jones was still in the air. Jimmy Neutron just came out. Oh, Saudi Arabia just pulled off the best social experiment of all time. Two airplanes. More importantly, some random French guy named Guanil Nicholas designed the Game Boy Advance and Nintendo had it on the market swiftly to pair with their upcoming GameCube. They also came out with fucking Half-Life in 2001. Remember that? Nicholas said he wanted the console to have a toy or a prototype feel, which is pretty fucking awesome. This thing definitely comes off as like a Fisher Price toy, but I think it's better for it. If it were any sleeker, I probably wouldn't like it. It kind of reminds me of the gamepad, which is equally as toy-like, but damn, I love this thing. It's the perfect size, length, and material for what it is, just like the GBA. I can't play Mother 3 on it though, so who fucking cares. Despite being a 32-bit console, the tech behind the GBA essentially made it a downgraded SNES alternative. People were way down for this though because it was portable and really convenient. Kind of like how people are settling for the Switch being a downgraded PS3, because they can play Hollow Knight on the toilet, where it belongs! Uh... The GBA was also cheap. Shit was like a hundred dollars, you'd be crazy not to have one. When I was a kid, I only ever had the pink SP that I lost the charger to, so I never had the original landscape model, but I definitely prefer it, just on looks alone. Need to pick up a modded one with a backlight one day so I can play fucking shit set radio. But anyway, yeah. The Game Boy Advance is definitely one of those really beloved consoles, so it's kind of funny to know how shitty its launch year was. It launched with Mario 2 and F-Zero on it, which are games you could already play elsewhere, but I guess it's nice to have them portably. Then they came out with a shitty Mario Kart, and then like, two strategy games, Advance Wars and Golden Sun. Now, I've heard lots of people talk good about both those games, but imagine being a Nintendo fan in 2001 that doesn't give a shit. Look at me, do I look cool or not low? I look retarded. You were stuck playing Mario 2 until November, and you can beat that shit in a night. Like, oh boy, can't wait to beat Mario 2 for the hundredth time, no! You know what, imagine being a Nintendo fan in 2001, period. I guess they objectively covered all their bases for their launch year on the genre of games that were covered, but this objectively doesn't matter, because Wario Land 4 came out on November 19th, completely validating your purchase of a Game Boy Advance. They said, let's take Wario, and put him in Egypt! Some of the first things you get when typing Wario Land 4 into the YouTube search bar is a plethora of videos that label the game as this hidden treasure or undiscovered masterpiece to present it to be more than what it is. Don't get me wrong, there's nothing bad about a catchy attention grabbing title, but the content of most of these videos are completely void. So uh, the game I'm playing right now is Wario Land 4. Oh, that's actually one of my favorites. I like the second though. Better just I feel like since it's the original, you know, it stands out. No, no, the first was the original, right? Yeah, never mind. The first is the original. They only really exist to perpetuate the game's reputation as this secret cult classic. Well, if you ask me, this game's pretty fucking popular. It's not underrated or overlooked or some other third thing. It's a good game and it gets a lot of attention. In fact, I'd say this game gets too much attention compared to its contemporaries. You never see anyone talking about Virtual Boy Wario Land. In fact, most people forget it even exists when covering the whole series. If you're talking about Game Boy Advance games, Wario games, or Nintendo platformers in general, you can't sit two feet in front of you without someone calling this game a masterclass example of the genre. Oh. Huh. No! 
Calling Wario Land 4 Nintendo's greatest achievement is the Sonic had a tough time jumping into 3D of Wario games. Wario had a tough time jumping into Land 4. I don't want to portray that I know any better or any worse than that of any other gaming analyst YouTuber. Except, oh wait, yes I do! Stop using this clip! Look guys, look! How many of these secret Nintendo Masterpiece videos have this? Or reference it? You ever see this? Now we need to blow a hole in it. Do you have the bomb, retarded fool? I can't believe he said retard. Can you believe he said retard? He said retarded. Oh! And by the way, really, what is it with people completely glossing over Virtual Boy? What, is it not good enough for you? Did you not know it existed or something? You couldn't do a Google search? Or would you rather have it be pink instead of red? Don't get me wrong, Wario Land 4 is the best game in the series, and I think it deserves the attention, no doubt, but I just think that attention's a bit... misdirected. I only feel the need to bring all this shit up is because some jerk-off wrote a book about it. People cite this fucking book back and forth like it's gospel, when all of it is pseudo-intellectual bullshit you can find in a YouTube video. How could you have written so many words while saying absolutely nothing? People treat it as if writing a book is some insurmountable task that immediately validates how well your opinion is conveyed, when all it really means is you were stupid enough to write a book of empty pages. What, you got a publisher to produce your book for you, meaning you have some semblance of validity in your argument? Fuck you! What do you think Charles Dickens thought of Wario? I'm gonna talk about this book for a bit because it pisses me off. It was written by a Daniel Johnson, and I found a bunch of old forum posts of him saying he didn't even play Virtual Boy Wario Land! How can you see yourself fit to talk about a series of games when you haven't even played the first sequel? Imagine if I was talking about Mario Galaxy, and the only frame of reference I ever had for comparison was Mario Brothers. What the fuck? Granted, this book is mostly about Wario Land 4 and not all the other games, but an essential of talking about this game is to know how its previous entries functioned, which this guy supposedly claims he does, but to my knowledge, he barely brings them up in the book beyond passing. How did you write 600 pages about Wario Land 4 while barely mentioning the other four games? Remember in the beginning of the video when I said that this dude shared his opinion on how his book is the most deep and comprehensive piece of writing ever written about a video game? Well, it's one of the first lines in the book, and he couples that statement with admitting that the book is less of a critique and analysis on Wario Land 4, and more of an evolved critique of games analysis as a whole. Boo! Maybe I'm missing the irony here, but listen, everyone and their mom who does games analysis does it because they saw some dude do it worse and they feel they can do better. In fact, most art is kind of like that. But imagine prefacing the front of your book with admitting that! This brand of self-awareness is infuriating. Just talk about Wario to me. Make me like you first before you fill my head with your shitty writing priorities. I don't care yet. I don't care at all, actually. I don't care. I came here to listen to you tell me Wario Land 4 is awesome, not how good it feels to drink your own cum. Forgive me for not reading the book all the way through. It's like 600 pages, but I skimmed through a lot of it, and every passage I read has so much of the dude just dragging out his vernacular to let me know he's an English major who paid attention. I can't even describe it, but like, look at this enemy chart. It's just so nothing. If anything, it's a bit inaccurate. Different transformations in this game have completely different vulnerability statuses. Some are invincible, some are completely open for attack, and some challenges involve you trying to avoid enemies that'll knock you out of a transformation you need. The difficulty relative to the states Wario can be in compared to the enemies isn't consistent, and that's what makes it good. Again, I didn't read the whole book, but that's a glaring inconsistency just from a surface level observation. I mean, read some of these reviews. They go into concise detail about my issues I had with the book through just skimming it, and these guys read the whole fucking thing. I want to quit talking about this shitty book now, because it sucks. So just like quit citing it as if it's some kind of medal to be awarded to this game's quality. Just like play the game. <laughs> Believe it or not, there's somewhat of a story here worth following. The staff went on record to say the story was made near the end of the game's development, but it still had a lot of ideas that connected aspects of the gameplay to it. The gameplay affected the story instead of the other way around, which is interesting. It's nothing too amazing, and if anything it's a little disjointed, but it contextualizes the locales of the game better than the other entries. You know, plot is like the last thing I care about in my baby platformer, but if it's fun enough I can get a lot of brownie points for me. In something like Virtual Boy Wario Land, the plot only exists to give reason for the gameplay. I criticize factors of the story and setting in that game for how it correlates to the gameplay, or rather how they barely correlate when they easily could. Wario Land 4 smoothens that critique by taking a similar format to Virtual Boy Wario Land, but it justifies a couple elements of the gameplay as a result of the story. Like, the game takes place in this pyramid, so the tutorial is conveyed through hieroglyphs. Or like this weird old man snooping through the secret rooms. 
This guy's actually pretty interesting. His name's Mad Seinstein, or Arero Shitan Hakase, which means Professor, or Dr. Arero Shitan. If you don't read into the plot at all, you wouldn't question him. You'd just pick him up and throw him where the puzzle needs you to without giving it a second thought. Once you look into it though, you realize he's actually a researcher, a part of the same group that discovered the pyramid you're in. He appears in a bunch of different Mario games too, but he first appeared in that Prince Sable game everybody only knows from Smash. He's kind of a cool do-it-all character actually. He shows up in Wario Land 3 as an enemy that transforms you, and he's even in Dr. Mario 64 as an opponent, and that game's my shit. He also did a character interview for Wario Land 4. He talks about jerking off. And they got rid of him after this, which is kind of a shame. I'm always down for cool additions to the Mario cast. Could you imagine a world where they threw out Wario after Mario Land 2? Like I said before, this story's pretty disjointed, but it doesn't really matter. Honestly, your game's story doesn't need to be all that thought out for me to consider it good, especially in a platformer. As long as you have characters I can attach to and a clear motive to go by, you're all good. For Wario, it's that he wants treasure and money, so he's always seeking out ways to get it. He reads in the paper about the recent discovery of a solid gold pyramid called the Pyramid of Shakora, which was excavated and dug up by a group of researchers and archaeologists. Wario decides to race over there in his El Dorado that looks like an AMC Gremlin X, while having no regard for the safety and well-being of any cats in the area. When he gets there, the same cat he nearly killed decides it fit to end its life early, and Wario feels remorse because... he's a black cat guy, and he jumps after it. You know, I can totally resonate with that. I saw Nichijo, and I liked Sakamoto. I read Gamer Cat. I like those cursed images of black cats. They're cute. I like them. Maybe if it was any other kind of cat, say a bobtail or one of those weird gray hairless cats, Wario just would have turned around and went home. Would have said, fuck that, that drops too high and left. But he doesn't. Because Wario loves black pussy. Pussy! <laughs> He ends up falling into a mobile game, which seems like a really easy joke to make here, but this bit genuinely reminded me of Tomb of the Mask, it's a cool time waster game with a similar aesthetic to the world map here. After completing a cool tutorial, all the different world options open up to Wario. Each world sends him into a different setting he has to traverse in order to find the tablet pieces that Mr. MacGuffin hid everywhere. Once he's found all of them in a world, he can conquer that area's boss and send the treasure acquired into the pyramid's core. After you've liberated all four areas and plundered all their treasure, the Inner Pyramid's passage will open, leading you to this place called the Golden Room, which isn't anything like the Velvet Room. You know, I've been watching a lot of Shark Tank recently. You know, that fucking show with the investors. It's got fucking Mark Cuban, Lori Griner, Damon John, all these big entrepreneurs. And every time I watch this show, I get a funny feeling about one of the sharks, Mr. Wonderful. It's got that big suit, the balding hairstyle, the defined nose. I think I finally figured him out. He looks like he's gonna sell me a persona! When you have no soldiers, you're wiped out. That's the game of life. Stop this madness. Okay, that's wonderful. But how do I make money off depressed people? You know why you're wearing those ties? You're pigs. Pigs get slaughtered. Poo-poo. Poo-poo. Pee-pee-poo-poo. Why are you being so greedy? You've completely wasted my time. I'm out. You see, it turns out the pyramid itself was buried by a greedy villain named the Golden Diva, who's looking to sink the pyramid and keep its riches for herself, and drive away any royalty from her plan. Princess Shakora, ruler of the... country in Wario Land 4, was turned into a cat during the infiltration through a curse the Diva had put on her. Powerless to stop the diva on her own, Cat Shakora roams the street in modern day. When she catches wind of Wario's plan to plunder the pyramid for all its riches by almost getting run over, she decides to help out Wario. Turns out the curse casted on Shakora grants her the ability to transform into these different shadow figures. She uses this to help Wario on his quest by guiding him to where he needs to be as a cat or supplying him with items as the shopkeeper. Wario, of course, doesn't really know or care about what's really going on. He's just kind of in it for the treasure. After platforming through the Golden Passage, Wario comes face to face with the Golden Diva, who's the final boss of the game. After Wario beats the shit out of her, the curse befalling the pyramid and the princess is lifted, and we get some pretty fun alternate endings differing on how quickly you beat each boss. The different endings show off Shakura's four different different forms she can take. A baby, a wario -ette, a long-haired princess, and a man! You get to see Wario kiss a baby like a pedophile or kiss a man like a homo! I'm guessing her different ending forms implicate some leftover transformation powers in her, which makes me question how long Shakura's been around in the world of Mario. Just how much influence do her transformation powers have on previous games like Wario Land 2 or 3? Maybe the transformations aren't sourced from Shakura, but rather the golden diva herself who's more of an entity than a person. 
It's likely that the Golden Divas existed longer than Wario or even Shakura herself, spreading her transformation curse wherever she passes through. This would make sense, actually, especially considering the only Wario Land game after this, Shake It, has no transformation sourced from enemies. The Golden Diva doesn't exist anymore. Shakura is supposed to be, like, an ancient princess, which is further conveyed in all versions of the ending, where she's raised into heaven and granted a halo, showing her age. So she's supposed to be, like, dead, but... The curse granted to her was restricting her access into the afterlife, which is pretty interesting considering other aspects of the game. The levels you get sent to through the vortexes have implications of existing in separate dimensions, and there's a consistent eerie theme of death or passing on in the game I picked up on. There's a level that's just your basic fire volcanic zone that freezes over at a certain point during your escape. Before I looked into it, I found it weird that this level was positioned in the part of the game where the rest of the levels were horror themed. Lava levels that freeze over are not a new concept for a platformer game. In fact, it's a bit cliched at this point, but after looking into it, people seem to interpret this level as hell instead of just some old cave. It kind of makes sense too, considering the level placement in the world and the phrase when hell freezes over. This looming theme of death and passing is really subtly done, but there's tons of things that support it. All the levels in general aren't very populated with people, minus the professor giving them this like abandoned feeling. The keys used to unlock the next level are these ghost guys. Nah, but, but I'm not gonna talk about the plot in this video game anymore. It's not a perfect plot, but it provides enough intrigue and cool concepts to contextualize the platforming in an engaging way. I like all the weird, nondescript details and implications about the characters and the pyramid itself, and it just serves as a well thought out bonus. They didn't skimp out on it. But I want to talk about Wario's duck jump. When you crouch and you jump, he looks like a dog. <laughs> when gameplay starts, the only option you can choose on the screen is a forced tutorial section. If this is your first time playing a Wario Land game, there's actually a lot to learn about Wario's moveset, so it makes sense to include an introductory level here. It isn't invasive at all though, which is sick. Most games, especially Nintendo games, would stop to open a dialogue box or have optional signs posted around that tell you how to play, but both ways of control conveyance in a tutorial kind of falter in some way. Text boxes can stop the flow of gameplay and it can be easy to miss or ignore optional signs. It'd be like one of those stop playing the game for a bit prompts Nintendo's obsessed with putting in their games. But you know what though? I like those! I'm not trying to spend 8 hours of my day playing Wii Sports, so you know, I appreciate it. In fact, the name of this channel is based off one of those. It's in fucking Virtual Boy Wario Land. Automatic pause? What? That's a good name for a channel. Oh fuck. <laughs> <laughs> the other alternative would just be to pop something on the screen that tells you how to play while you're still playing, but it can still seem pretty out of place. Wario Land 4 opts to paint the controls on the wall, which, you know, isn't a completely unique or groundbreaking way of telling the player what to do, but having them be hieroglyphs adds a bit of reason to things, which is appreciated. The controls in this game are fucking great though. You get everything you need right from the get-go, no more unlock bullshit. You got your shoulder bash, your ground pound, you pick enemies up and throw them, and you have a new dash. If you hold L or R, Wario will automatically begin sprinting in that respective direction, eventually hitting a terminal velocity, allowing him to barrel through most enemies and blocks. The move has this really cool after image effect attached to it, where Wario's animation will play behind him while going through an array of greens, blues, and purples. I really love this effect attached to the move, it has an automatic depth to it, making it look 3D to me in a way. The move itself is also great, it allows for fast flowing movement in escape sections and easy traversal. Speaking of looking fantastic, the sprite work in this game is definitely the peak of the series. I really love the liberties they took from the art of Wario to his sprite. He decided to make his shoes purple from the usual green, made his hair pitch black, he turns into a dog when he duck jumps, I love it! Everything has that really detailed pixel art coloring, which meshes really well with the designs and shape structure of all the characters. It's something the game's indie successor, Pizza Tower, would take note of and opt to transform. That game has a more loose and unpolished style, it looks more like they were drawn freehand rather than meticulously done up. We'll talk more about Pizza Tower later, but I just wanted to bring it up now to mention how almost opposite the spriting styles are, despite equally complementing the designs and animations. Back to the moveset, it's a little weird to me they were so quick to drop the super jump after its usage in the first game. It doesn't show up in any other Wario game after 3, which is curious considering how unique of an ability it is to the character's arsenal. Maybe they couldn't find any use case for it, or maybe they just didn't feel the need to design platforming and puzzle elements around it, but I stand by its potential. A core of this game's structure is actually a bit comparable to the time platforming idea I talked about in the Virtual Boy Wario Land section. But since this game doesn't have the super jump, it always boils down to just getting to where you need to be within a tense amount of time. No justice for the super jump, I guess. The move feels like an idea they had for Wario to set him apart from Mario, but just couldn't push far enough to be useful in the games, especially since the move gets the most use in Wario Land 2 and 3's slower-based gameplay.
I guess it's sort of like that move from Metroid where you run at like a mock pace and then do a jump directly upward to reach new areas, but retooled to be more suited for Wario. Uh, actually, the speed booster you get in the Metroid games is basically just the super dash you have in Wario Land 4. They have the same exact properties. The only difference is Samus has to unlock it, whereas Wario starts out with his. You'd think they would have added the move to Wario Land 2 or 3 so they can retool its application to better suit how similar those games are to Metroid, but no, it's in Wario Land 4. They probably just didn't think about it for 2 and 3, but its inclusion in 4 is pretty noteworthy, especially since, apparently, Zero Mission, Fusion, and Wario Land 4 were all developed using the same engine. There's a lot of visual and artistic similarities to Metroid Fusion and Wario Land 4, especially in the background art, but I don't know. A ton of games reuse or borrow assets from each other, even for games in entirely different series. That was like Valve's whole deal back then. Metroid and Wario being programmed on top of the same architecture is pretty cool though, especially noting how different the controls and physics are for both of them. The fact they share this speed booster slash dash move is a cool tidbit that gives a little bit of insight to the internal workings of these two franchises despite the completely opposing paths they ended up taking. Fusion and Wario Land 4 also use the same fucking font. Anyway, there aren't a lot of vertical levels in this game. That I think there's like two, but I think combining shoulder bashing, dashing, and super jumps in one winding obstacle course would make for great reactionary platforming. They sort of do this with the Golden Passage, which is the last level that's meant to test all your abilities, but the level is more centered around the transformations Wario can go through rather than his own moveset. This is fine, it actually works kind of well regarding some transformations needing to be avoided and others being required, but I would have much rather had this level be split into two. One testing the player's knowledge and prowess of their base moves, and another testing them on their handle of the transformations. The Golden Passage itself is a little frustrating because of how it's laid out. The screen below the progression layer is full of water that pushes you back to the previous challenge, meaning if you fuck up, you have to do it again. This wouldn't really be that much of an issue if collecting the boss tablets didn't also send you back to redo the challenge. Just give me that shit as a reward for doing it, why should I have to go and do it all over again? It's the same as the Wario Land 2 shit where getting transformed sets you back. Granted, it's done better here, but a smooth turd is still equally as comparable to a chunky turd. They're both poo-poo. I only want to focus on the base moves because the physics in this game feel like a really good blend of Wario Land 1 and Virtual Boy Wario Land. Wario's maneuverability in this game is pretty comparable to Virtual Boy Wario Land's emphasis on flow and continuous movement, but his weight and speed without dashing is more akin to the first game. You can still do that shoulder bash jump trick to gain speed, but because of the addition of the dash, it isn't your top speed and is more reserved for tight platforming done quickly and precisely, which is awesome. This kind of movement is present throughout the entire game, but it's really apparent in the Golden Passage, which is why I wish it was more of a focus. Everything about how Wario moves works in tandem together, and it makes for a lot of really unique platforming challenges within the level structure. Speaking of which, I guess now is a good time as ever to talk about that. My next point. Each stage has Wario trying to find the key to progress to the next level, which is exactly how it worked in Virtual Boy Wario Land. The difference here, however, is that in order to exit the level, you don't need the key. Instead, you need to step on this frog switch. The switch opens a portal back to the hub located at the beginning of the level, and often the switch to open said portal is near the end. There's a time limit to how long the portal is open, and once it runs out, the treasure you collected on your expedition will start to fly out of you until you leave. If you run out of treasure, it's time's up. The key, who's this cute little ghost guy named Keezer by the way, is actually used to unlock the entrance to the next level, not the exit to the one you're in. You can grab or ignore Keezer and easily make your way to egress either way. What's egress mean? Exit. However, because the exit is your entrance, you have to find the frog switch. This is in contrast to Virtual Boy Wario Land, where you can't leave the level you're in until you've found the key. The reason for this difference is so that if you're having trouble finding Keezer, you can leave the level without him, travel to a course in a different world, and then just come back for him later. Yeah, Wario Land 4 has an open level structure like that. I'm guessing the reason they did it is so that the game could be longer in comparison to Virtual Boy Wario Land. You can play the first level in any world without a price, meaning you can do it in whatever order you want, but the difficulty progression of the worlds is a little vague and isn't conveyed by the map very well. Players not looking to experiment will most likely play the levels in a counterclockwise order, but the difficulty of each zone is broken up oddly. In hindsight, since green is the easiest, then yellow, then red, then blue, you'd think the placement of the zones would reflect that, but they're seemingly placed at random. While I do think the passages should be sat next to each other in order of difficulty, making the progression open like this gives as much time as the player needs to feel out what levels they want to spend the most time in and which they want to avoid. Maybe they feel one level is too hard and want to come back to it later, whether it be because they keep dying or they can't find all the tablets to open the boss door. They can do this, they're allowed to enter a different level in a different zone. I'm guessing the team did this so you'd play the game more on your first playthrough. 
Once you learn all there is to know about how the worlds work in this game, your second playthrough won't have any hiccups with you switching worlds unless you just want to play a different level just because. Dedicated players will most likely just knock out whatever world they choose to go for without switching around, but it really just depends on how you want to play the game. Perhaps ideally, the world map would have Wario automatically walk over the entrance to the green world after completing the tutorial, but not enter it. This would instill the idea in the player that this is where the game wants you to go due to its easy difficulty. If the worlds were placed in counterclockwise order of difficulty and the game forces Wario to move right, it would also encourage new players to keep moving right if they want to tackle each level in order of difficulty. This addition might sound like it would ruin the game's open-ended nature, but the function would only occur once after finishing the tutorial, and you could easily go against what the game was pushing you to do to go to another world instead. I can imagine some people who played this game for the first time ended up playing the Green Passage last and maybe felt duped by its difficulty, but this could potentially remedy that problem. I think it would be a lot more comforting if the game pointed you in the right direction a bit, at least on your first playthrough. It probably wouldn't be that hard to implement this on an internal level, but I don't know. People don't like to be told what to do when they play a video game, so maybe this is a stupid idea. The more you play the game over, the more you just tend to tackle each world in the order given to you anyway. The world map isn't bad as is, it's actually really smart, I just think a few areas of it could be polished to make it even better. It's an answer to the world map introduced in Wario Land 3, but also a response to the linear progression design in the original Wario Land. It's a really great blend. It's, talk about the levels already, I'm getting antsy! I'm just gonna go through the ones I think are interesting or important in terms of visuals or mechanics. The first world is the Emerald Passage, which has your obvious level themes covered. There's a sunny tropical area, a floral treetop, a basic lake, and a rainforest jungle. There's surprisingly a lot to talk about with the first level, Palm Tree Paradise. It's an introduction level that allows the player to get a handle on most of their skills from the get-go, like in any other game. But I think it also accurately instills the collect-a-thon objective of getting as much treasure as you can in a really intriguing way. I didn't really question it when initially playing this series, but the motive of getting as much treasure as you can in Wario Land is sort of intrinsic to the player, especially if they've already played a Mario game before. This is done beyond Wario's characterization as a protagonist fueled by greed, as collecting money and other goodies can be a focal point in Mario games. You want to collect all the coins you can find in a Mario game because that shit gives you lives, which is security for when you bust your ass on a Koopa. It works as security in Wario Land 4 as well, protecting you from a time-up death, but that aspect of collecting treasure doesn't come up often enough for the player to worry about collecting things for that reason. It's not like Sonic where you want rings because they'll keep you safe, you want treasure because you want a good score. The game even calculates your points at the end of each level and records high scores, giving it elements of a score attack. The score attack nature of this game is helped by the level's condensed design. You can beat almost all of them within like 2-4 to four minutes, which makes them good to replay and try your hand at a better score. Losing treasure during a time-up section isn't disheartening because your security is running up, it's disheartening because you just worked your ass off to get a good score. SCORE 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 SCORE! The game incentivizes collection with the score system, but also in its placement of goodies right off the bat. Right near the beginning of the level, there's a group of gems just high enough where Wario can't jump to get them, but there's an outline of a block that, when filled in, would allow Wario to easily jump up and grab them. You could just find the switch needed to fill in the blocks and get them during your escape to the level, in fact, it might even be more efficient to do that, but there's other ways of achieving the same goal here. There's an enemy right below the gems here that, when jumped on, will give you just enough height to collect them, but hasty players might see the enemy and instantly shoulder bash it, ruining their chance of using it for extra height. Thankfully though, there's an enemy on the same screen you can lead under the gems by picking them up and dropping them where they need to be, allowing you to jump on them if you missed your chance before. Ah! Listen, I don't want to question your intelligence by over-explaining this, since it's so simple. But the conflicting motive of the player to collect gems and kill enemies for score is instantly challenged in the first level, and I think that's really cool. I don't want to make it seem like I'm, like, talking down to you. <laughs> it's instantly clear that there's more than one way to get this group of gems within Wario's moveset, and upon reflection, this might have been why they didn't include the super jump. Being able to jump higher would have added a more instantaneous option for collecting loads of treasure in this game, since there's a lot of similar challenges like this one scattered throughout. Perhaps robbing Wario of a versatility option in order to make challenges require more critical thinking was a trade the designers were willing to make, but I still think the inclusion of the super jump would have lent itself to a lot of cool potential platforming sequences. Later in the level, there's a hidden wall that has a bonus gem inside that has a hint of green hanging off of it, indicating that you can walk through the wall. 
Maybe it's because this is the first level and they want you to realize that there can be secrets like this around the game, but they indicate it even further by putting a conspicuous platform leading into the wall on the other end of it. The first side of the wall doesn't have a platform leading into it, and if you notice the ground indication on that side, you can enter from there. If you miss it on a first pass, they just make it more obvious to make sure that you don't miss it, at least just for this first level. The rest of the level is pretty standard, there's another invisible wall you can pass through for another bonus gem, but this one's a one-way door, you can't enter from the other side due to the size of the exit. I initially thought this was some kind of layering trick. Maybe entering the secret wall puts you on a layer behind the main layer, meaning trying to enter it from a layer trigger that's meant to put you on the main layer wouldn't work. Now that I look at it, the way the ground is leveled makes it so that to even have a chance at fitting through the hole, you need to do a shoulder bash jump, which increases Wario's hitbox just enough to where he'll bounce off the wall and not be able to fit in. What's cool about these secret walls is that if you're aware of their existence, you can use them to escape faster during the time section, which I like a lot. It's especially important since the faster you escape, the more points you get. The way this game is constantly giving you things to take into consideration on top of your current priority is really engaging and only evolves as the game goes on and the levels get more complex. Wario Land 4 still has the transformation forms, but there are leagues better in this game than they are in any other entry. The first instance of transforming in the game is Fat Wario in this first level. You know, Wario's kind of a weird guy. When he eats an apple, he gets real fat, and it makes the game not fun. I'm not a fan of this transformation in general, but it's definitely streamlined in this game compared to the previous entries. It thankfully doesn't last nearly as long as the previous games, and the applications it's used for are alright. Instead of requiring Fat Wario as the only means for finding a secret or completing a puzzle, he's usually a transformation that leads you to an area where you'll find a different transformation you need to progress. Fat Wario essentially just makes your normal jump have the properties of a ground pound, but also decrease the height of your jump and slows you down. This is mostly used to break blocks under a ceiling that you normally couldn't ground pound to break, which is maybe a bit rudimentary, but it's never used in an annoying or obtuse way for it to bother me, unlike in Mario Land 2 or 3. I think whoever was in charge of designing the transformations for this game could have done something a lot more interesting with Fat Wario. It's just such a boring transformation that adds nothing to the game beyond making it slower. It's not even that hard to fix. All you really have to do is shorten how long the transformation lasts even more. Maybe even set it up so five jumps will turn Wario back to normal or something. You know, that's pretty good. You could even design platforming puzzles around that. Maybe start with Fat Wario on the top of the screen and have it so you need to fall to platforms below him and reach a block that he can only break within five jumps. If you go over five jumps, you miss out on the treasure because you turn back to normal, but if you make it with another jump intact, you can break the block and reach it. And they already have blocks that you can break only with Fire Wario signified by a fire symbol, so I find it strange they didn't do the same for Fat Wario, instead opting to just make his jumps act like normal ground pounds. Right now, Fat Wario just sort of wastes any time I could be spending playing the game, which sucks. He's definitely my least favorite transformation, but he's also used the least of the bunch, so I guess it isn't too bad. You know, the game isn't too egregious for too long, just a little bit. Like I said before, you mostly use Fat Wario to break these hidden blocks to access areas you couldn't before, but most of the time there's no reason for it to need the transformation. If the ceiling wasn't always low, you could just ground pound this shit, but Again, the transformation isn't used much anyway. I kinda wish blocks you're meant to destroy with it always looked like this one in Palm Tree Paradise, where it like, melds into the tile set already on screen, but that might be better suited for harder levels. It's less obvious than making it the basic hard to break blue block asset and forces the player to analyze their surroundings better, but it's not too big of a deal, I guess. If anything, it would make more sense to have an obvious block here, considering this is the first level. There's secrets in this game that have no indication of existing at all, but this tile they used to hide the underground section in this level is a great idea. It's unfortunate they opt to signify secrets with such an obvious asset more than half the time, but I don't know, maybe they were just sick of spriting shit. Have you ever made a sprite sheet before? It's fucking annoying, so you know, I don't blame them. I guess now would be as good a time as ever to talk about the transformations as a whole. Wario Land 4 has the same transformations from the previous games, but opts to take away the superfluous ones instead of making a batch of new ones. They all, on paper, function similarly to the way that they used to, but there's a lot of underlying changes in the function, physics, and application of them that makes them more enjoyable to use. The crux of the transformation mechanic was always about hindering Wario's mobility in order to give him a unique attribute he couldn't do before in his base state. They aren't straight up upgrades to him, unlike the hats in the earlier games, which sets them apart as a central mechanic. Wario Land 2 and 3, as I discussed before, mostly uses transformations to take the player through slow, gated progression puzzles that don't really require any problem solving or critical thinking. Either that, or they just straight up send him backwards. 
It was usually Mario needs to get here, transform and take him there, but oh, the transformation sucks, so you'll probably fuck up a lot and have to retry. The good thing about the transformations in 4, though, is that they don't entirely suck to use. They still have ones you're meant to avoid that send you back, but there's a lot less of them, and they only appear as a proper avoidable obstacle when platforming. And even then, some of the puzzle rooms use those transformations in unique puzzle-solving applications. It's true that I'd rather be normal Wario most of the time, but since they tweak so much of the functions of the transformations, I don't groan when I see one. It's just lots of polishing and little things. Like, Puffy Wario can accelerate his ascent now, making it faster to cancel out of him by hitting the ceiling if you fucked up. Flat Wario's falling arc has been fixed and is completely smooth compared to the horribly conveyed jittery nightmare of 2 and 3. Fire Wario is way more interesting than before. He's mostly used in areas where the block you need to destroy is higher up, so you need to time your jumps and count how many walls you need to bounce off of in order to get where you need to be. And they aren't perfect, of course. You know, Snowball Wario, while used for some cool puzzles, lasts too long and halts flow, and Frozen Wario definitely isn't used enough for puzzles, and Fat Wario exists. As a whole though, the transformations are miles better than they were, and I'll go more into it on a level by level basis. What I like about Wario Land 4 is that the game is more centered around blending action platforming and puzzle solving, which means the transformations need to not only test your puzzle solving skills, but also your platforming skills. It's an evolution of what was introduced in Virtual Boy Wario Land, but even that game had more of a priority on platforming than it did puzzles. Puzzles. I'll go more into my designation of design priority of all the games later, but First, I want to highlight some levels in the Topaz world, and that's Big Board and Domino Row. This is gonna be fucking long, so... <laughs> Both levels have exclusive external mechanics Wario has to deal with in them. Big Board has a roulette that will help or hinder him, and Domino Row has a switch that triggers a race against dominoes that'll close off paths to bonuses if you lose. They're both really unique levels. In fact, all the levels in the Topaz world have something like this. Most levels in the game have something like this, but it's definitely the most prevalent here. It's the one world that changes the status quo structure of the game the most, which is cool considering its toy boxy creation theme. In Big Board, when you stand underneath- In Big Board, when you stand underneath this- ugh, FUCKING UNDERNEATH- Okay, in Big Board, you stand under this block of numbers that are spinning in succession, a line of different results will appear on the screen, and it becomes abundantly clear how these two things correlate. Okay. Getting a number on the block progresses the line forward that many spaces, and your goal is to manipulate what number you get so you can land on your desired result. The results may range from giving Wario more health, spitting out a bonus diamond, spawning a batch of enemies, or maybe even changing Wario into whatever transformation is needed in that room. This is a really cool idea, but its execution is rather lackluster on top of the level being a little on the short side. This level is almost entirely focused on figuring out how to solve that room's puzzle or get to whatever treasure there is and move on, so platforming takes a bit of a back seat here. That's not a bad thing though, it's actually quite enjoyable as a pace breaker. The new mechanic is fun to mess around with and take advantage of to get goodies, but unfortunately that's all it's really used for, bonus treasure. The level doesn't force you to get antiquated with the roulette at all in order to progress. You can just skip every instance of it by darting to the end, there's nothing blocking you from moving forward. You'd think it shouldn't even matter, especially since the motive to collect as much treasure as you can is already embedded into the player, but it has a lot of unexpected drawbacks. My first time playing this level, I actually missed a handful of secrets because the game just let me pass through without exploring and I got carried away. The level doesn't incentivize taking advantage of this new mechanic to seek out all you can. If there were multiple blockades in a room that you had to clear out by using the roulette, it would let the player know there's multiple paths to take so they don't forget and maybe come back during their escape to see what they missed. Maybe that's my fault, but it seems like an odd oversight they didn't block progression through the level via the central mechanic. It's like they forgot or something. This wouldn't really be a problem if it wasn't mandatory to use the roulette to exit the level, and it's made even worse since the way this is conveyed is super vague. At the end of the level, you're placed in a room with seemingly no exit, and the only thing inside of it is a roulette box. The walls are plastered with get a goal, and the floor below you is flashing rainbow colors with the same phrase. What you're supposed to do is hit the block over and over and make the line reach its end, designated by a goal icon, but when I got here I was completely stumped. I didn't know the line had an end to it, let alone that it was designated by a goal, so I spent the entire time just mumbling get a goal to myself like a psycho while trying to find an exit to the room that didn't even exist. What am I getting? What am I doing? Yeah, just, uh, get a goal? Uh, Get a, get the, just get the diamond. Why? What does this mean? Okay. Oh wait. Well, that doesn't fucking help me. How do I get out of here? Get a goal? But why? Thank God. <laughs> no. What do I need to do? I don't know. 
What the fuck? Ah, fucking A. What the fuck? I can't go back. I don't know. What the, what the fuck? This is the only room I can go into, too. Get a goal. Yeah. What's the right goal? There. It has to be the diamond. I I already the diamond just gives you a diamond. Hey, no, we'll hit it again. It just gives me a diamond, doesn't it? Yeah. What the hell? Well, at least you got a diamond. I'm gonna. It's not gonna matter. There's a couple of really easy ways this could have been fixed up that I can't for the life of me think why they didn't go for. For one, starting the level in a room that paints what each icon does on the wall would have been really helpful to the conveyance of the mechanic, just like they did with the tutorial. It would also let the player know beforehand that there's an end to the line, so they wouldn't have to guess as much come the end of the level. As it is now, you have no way of knowing what each result does until you try them, and that can lead to some guesswork, which is completely unnecessary. You're just meant to trust what the game tells you to get on these signs, but again, there's no way of knowing what each of them does until you try it, and it can lead to you getting hit or making a mistake due to the surprise. It sounds like I'm whining here, but it just feels like arbitrary difficulty. Like here, you're meant to spawn enemies to throw them through the breakable wall and crawl through to a bonus, but because the game spawns three over your head and they're an enemy type that you've not only never seen before, but will also hurt you if you touch them, it's all but too likely you'll panic and get hit for no reason. If the enemies spawn behind you instead of on top of you, or if the enemy type was one you've already seen before in the level, like these toy Wario cars, it wouldn't be that much of an issue. It's just conveyed really poorly, but it doesn't even really matter in the long run since it isn't required to beat the level anyway, which just sort of makes it worse. Even if you use every roulette the amount of times the game wants you to, there really is no way of knowing there's an end to the line once you get to the final room. I just assumed it was endless, which I think is a valid thing to think. It would be different if the room had the line graphic plastered on the wall, and maybe they highlight the goal icon with the asset they made for it. The phrase get a goal is way too vague for me to discern anything about what the fuck that's supposed to mean, it needs to be a lot clearer. Why didn't it just say finish the line or something? I also think the level would benefit from better application of the mechanic in general. It would be interesting if in order to progress you were forced to use the block, but each path to progression required a different result. Maybe the numbers on the block don't spin in succession, but at random, and it's up to chance what result you end up getting that'll help you through whatever respective path you end up having to take. That is gonna be a little bit confusing, but, you know, stick with me here. If they were designing the mechanic based around reacting to the shock of the result, I think this would have been way better. For example, let's say you come to a crossroads, and there's one roulette block that'll disappear once you hit it. One path has a block only Fire Wario can break in order to enter, and the other has these mini blocks that you can throw an enemy through allowing you to crawl through once you've done it. Once you hit the block and it gives you your randomly designated result, you need to react and approach the challenge accordingly to which one you're gonna get. Or what if there were three paths, one only reachable via Fire Wario, one that you need to throw something quickly through to access, like a bomb or something, and one Wario can just access himself without anything extra. If you miss your chance as Fire Wario, or the bomb explodes before you can align it for a throw, you still have the option to proceed as Normal Wario. However, Normal Wario's path has less goodies for you to collect. Maybe particularly hard to reach paths would harbor things like the collectible CDs or diamonds. Once you reach the end and you hit the frog switch, what if the roulettes change from random numbers to ones that go in order? That way, whatever your escape path looked like, you could plan what results you got better than the first half, allowing you to travel faster under the time limit. Listen, I'm just spitballing here, but I think giving the player multiple ways to accomplish the same goal would do this level and this mechanic justice. It's fine as it is now being exclusively for bonus treasure, but I think it could be a whole lot better if it was required to use. Oh yeah, this level also has this really fucking scary background. I own one less pair of jeans because of this shit. I pee peed. I pissed myself. Speaking of the backgrounds, there's a couple of really cool ones that are definitely just 3D models they scanned in. It reminds me of something out of Hylix or DKC. This game really covers its bases artistically in this aspect, which is why I think it might be my favorite Wario Land visually, you know, aside from the really great sprite art. This is definitely the peak of intrigue of art in this series, which means, ah shit, it's all downhill from here. Which also means I think Shake It looks bad! There's tons of different tones, aesthetics, and styles being displayed all at once in Wario Land 4, and one might say they feel inconsistent or out of place, but I feel it's that way on purpose. Everything looks the way it does for an extrapolatable reason. Ow, ow, six, 
monosyllable words hurt my brain. Like that one mini game you play being low detail because it's being played off of a TV or hell, even the backgrounds I just mentioned. I'd wager one of the reasons this giant robot's a 3D image they scanned in was so that they could really convey the imposing nature of it through its scale and depth, which is really hard to emulate with pixel art. You might not even notice this robot's a render in the first place, but the light bouncing off that soldering tool is a good tell, and it was definitely done with intent. There are other backgrounds in the game that look like they could be 3D, but they definitely aren't. Like that creepy stuffed animal one is definitely just meticulously well done pixel art, and one of the factory ones even looks like photo bashed images of real pipes and machinery. There's of course no way to know for sure, but I feel like they wouldn't go through this effort to cover this many styles with such limiting hardware in the first place if they didn't give a shit. It leaves a lot of room for the artists to explore a bunch of different options on how to portray the tone they're going for for each world. I don't mean to shit on Celeste so hard in this video, but a big reason I really can't get down with that game's visual style is because of the lack of thought that went into covering that many bases. You got the pixel art character sprites in-game, the hand-drawn portraits during speech, the 3D low-poly world, which they're all well made, but they feel superfluous or thoughtless. Like it feels like they didn't think about how the art would gel together, but instead just did a bunch of things they thought were cool where they don't fit for no reason. Now, Celeste is nothing like Wario Land in any other way, but I think they're a bit contrastable in this case. Wario also has a world map with a different camera angle compared to its gameplay, but it maintains the normal style the rest of the game holds. No other part of the game looks like the world map, but it maintains the same visual style regardless. It's not like they couldn't have done something different for the world map if they wanted to. I can see them doing something natively 3D here, or for the backgrounds. The GBA was definitely capable of shit like that, but they just decided not to for sake of consistency within their inconsistency. Or, you know, maybe they couldn't. The Game Boy was kind of a piece of shit when it came to native 3D. All the pre-rendered stuff in this game is compressed really cleverly though to make it seem like it was sprited. Some of the art is made to just look 3D, but then some of it is made to look simple yet effective, kind of like Yoshi's Island. Yoshi's Island also had some 3D though. It just all feels really thought out in Wario Land, but then again, maybe the Celeste thing is an unfair comparison. There's definitely visual aspects of Wario Land 4 that are missteps in this direction. These end cards don't look like any other close-up shots in the game, and Wario's proportioned all weird. You can definitely tell it was done by a different artist they had on. And not every minigame is low detail or made with the TV thing in mind. One of them just uses straight up game assets, but even then, they're wholly original sprites that appear there and nowhere else, so. I'm a little biased against Celeste, I'll admit, but still, that's an indie game made by a little over eight people under a budget, you know, not counting all these fucking writing assistants and narrative consultants. Yeah, great job, guys! What'd you do?! Alright, I was looking for footage to put in this part, and I forgot that Celeste won the Best Independent Game at the Game Awards in 2018. Uh, and I also forgot that this gag <laughs> was, was also there. Oh. oh, no, 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 that wasn't a good one. We didn't get a good one. My eyes were closed. Say Manchego! Manchego? <laughs> uh, uh, uh. That's a good one, that's a good one. Oh, I'm gonna get some big V-Bucks for this, okay? <laughs> In any case though, it makes sense there'd be a lot of room for error for them, and they deserve a lot of credit where credit is due. Wario Land 4 had a team of 21 experienced Japanese old men with big Nintendo bucks in their leather wallets on the staff. And the only two guys not experienced on the team were the art guys, Goro Abe and Ko Takuchi. They were both programmers and designers on this game as their first project at Nintendo, and would immediately end up leading the WarioWare series right after, so it's no stretch of the imagination to say that they were also semi-responsible for the art in this game. There's unfortunately no one credited for the art direction, but if I had to take an educated guess, I'd say it was these two. But, you know, what do I know? The scale between a Nintendo game and an indie game is definitely not comparable, which is almost impossible to avoid talking about when comparing game stuff like this, so I'll just trust you know what I mean and we'll move on. See, I can say stuff like that to you now because we're like, what, a couple hours into the video? Not on the first page of my book? No one's credited for the sound design either, which sucks because it's pretty damn great. I really appreciate all the little things they took the time to execute. Like the music getting quicker the faster Wario's moving, getting all fucked up when he transformed, or however whatever Wario spats out himself is also subject to morph with the music. They ultimately don't add much to the game itself, but it makes the experience all the more memorable. It all adds to the vibe of the game, and coupling it with unique instrumentation and utilization of the GBA sound font makes it all really interesting. There's all these weird samples of actual singing, but it's paired with a heavy emphasis on that digital organ everybody loves so much now, which rules. They actually they ended up reusing a lot of the compositions they made for Wario Land 4 in the original WarioWare, but that makes sense considering these games share a composer, Ryoji Yoshitomi. 
It also makes me feel like they maybe wanted to make Wario Land and WarioWare extensions of the same universe, but one ended up being more successful and cost-efficient than the other and took over, so whatever. I think Yoshitomi did a good job of making a lot of really catchy tracks. His previous credits include help with the music on the original Wario Land, but he also helped with the sound design on Mario Paint, which leads me to believe he also did the sound for this game, but that's a total guess. He also did the sound effects for the original Mario Maker, which is like the most well-designed sound on the Wii U in my opinion. Actually, you know, he really likes that, doesn't he? Seems to be a trend that the sound is connected to the music in some way with most of the projects he works on. It sort of reminds me of that old video of that Mario World ROM hack level that's like a auto runner music thing. Shit blew my mind as a kid, still kind of awesome. <laughs> It's a classic. DIY is sort of a good way of describing it, I think. You get all these scanned in pictures of models, real life images of people, samples being used from everywhere like fucking dog noises and car crashes and shit, but they somehow correlate really well. They'd evolve on this scrappy weird tone more in the WarioWare games and it really works there. There's even a game where you can make your own assets for your own micro game, so it's cool how it all kind of works out that way. There really isn't much to say about the music and sound in Wario Land 4 that hasn't already been said before, so it's a little bit hard to talk about. It's pretty good, but I'm definitely not humming any of these songs. I mean, come on, I wouldn't listen to this shit in my car on my way to work or some shit. You ever heard of, like, Tim Fallen? Fucking Anamana Gucci? You fucking... <laughs> you, know what I'm you know what I'm saying? There are these collectible CDs that add to a sound room I could talk about, I guess. They don't give you the music for the level you found them in, but instead an entirely original track, a lot of which are very avant-garde. It's not like high art or anything, most of it is just repeated sounds that indicate some kind of circumstance, like a tap dance battle or something, but it's still really neat. So yeah, the art in this game is pretty fucking good. I really like the time-up graphic. That's a fucking- oh, that's such a good video. Anyway, the other level I wanted to highlight is Domino Row, which is thankfully a lot better than Big Board. Once you pass this pole, a row of dominoes will start to fall, and your goal is to race them to the end to push this button on their path before they do. If Wario pushes the button before the dominoes do, it'll topple a special set of blocks that are frequently blocking not only optional treasures like secret rooms or diamonds, but also the tablets you need to progress to the boss. If the dominoes push the button before Wario does, the wall stays unchanged and you're locked out of whatever was behind it forever, unless you restart the level. This immediately fixes the easy progression issue in Big Board and makes for a much more high stakes level. The level also has overall better conveyance than Big Board. The first room you spawn in has no dominoes to race and it gives you a button to push for free allowing you to progress. It lets the player know what their objective is quickly and pushes them in the right direction right off the bat in a non-intrusive way. Maybe the solution to the conveyance of Big Board I proposed is intrusive, but that mechanic is pretty complex compared to this one, so I think it's a bit warranted to let the player know what they're getting into. Anyway, back to fucking dominoes. Everyone knows this basic game design shit where you fucking introduce the mechanic in a safe environment and fu fucking Undertale, whatever, you know, you get it. This level does that in a way where I didn't even really question it, it's really natural. Most levels with a new thing to grasp do this, but I think Domino Row stands out for its focus on platforming in a fast, precise way. I really like that most of the treasure you can collect in a room with dominoes only exists when the dominoes are falling. It makes the player not only think about what moves they need to utilize to get to where they need to be fast, but also what path they're taking. Also, all the rooms in this level are designed for you to be able to go backwards through once hitting the button so you don't miss any potential goodies off the beaten path. If you're really cool though, you can get everything during the race against the dominoes, wasting some time in the race overall, but maintaining flow of movement. I love that a lot, it splits whatever treasures hidden around the rooms to be exploited by two different kinds of players. Those who know within their ability that they can get it during the race, or those who want to prioritize ensuring they don't miss out on whatever the dominoes will block if they lose. It's sort of a risk versus reward thing, but the reward of immediate treasure is within the risk of potentially messing up and losing the race, on top of achieving flow of movement, which is awesome. I personally don't want to fucking stop and go back through the room I'm in. I want to do everything as I see it, especially since I'm not sure if I'll be able to come back to the room I'm in during the escape. This kind of design also really encourages speed running. It has elements of path optimization gameplay. Maybe this is just my preference bias, but some of my favorite games are the ones where you're meant to do something really, really fast, and there's an optimal way of doing so that the designers intended. 
More than half the fun in those games isn't doing what you're meant to do, but it's figuring out what they want you to do. I love that shit a lot. You see it in like Trackmania and like a lot of Sonic games. Again, like in Big Board, I wish the level was just a bit longer, maybe an extra room or two. I only say that so they can capitalize on this mechanic they probably spent a fuck ton of time programming to get right, especially since they don't ever use it again past here. They even utilize most of Wario's base moveset, most noteworthy being the part where you're meant to turn into a ball on these slopes to outpace the dominoes. It's really cool that they use the ball form to encourage the player to take a harder but faster path during the escape sequence too. I really love the reactionary platforming the ball form is conducive to. It was my favorite parts of Wario Land 2 and 3, so it's great to see it capitalized on here so well. The only gripe I really had with the ball form is that it isn't used enough, but that's made up for by how well designed the ball sections that do exist in the game are. Something I really like about this level is that, at least in my playthrough, it was the first level I came across to have an area exclusively locked behind frog switch blocks. At the beginning of the level, you can see keys are underneath two frog blocks and can recognize that you'll probably end up dropping down to whatever's below him in order to take him out of the stage. But what's a little unfortunate though is that the area below here is a bit lackluster. It doesn't even use the domino mechanic we've been playing with for the entire level. I'm guessing they didn't want to use a time-centric mechanic on top of another time-centric mechanic, but still, this area isn't that big. I think having the final challenge of the level culminate in the usage of the dominoes would have made it a complete package. They could have at least locked access to the last tablet behind the domino blocks and had you find the switch to topple them, but no, there's literally zero usage of anything used in the level in this final room here, which kinda stinks. Nah, you can never know with this shit though. Maybe they were pressed for time and had something going for this room, but it just wasn't working out so they decided to scrap it. What's interesting to note here, I think, is that Big Board and Domino Row are sort of inverses of each other in terms of priority and design. Where Big Board introduces a mechanic beneficial to puzzle solving, Domino Row introduces a mechanic more apt for platforming. The two sides of the same coin are represented in the same world and it makes me kind of wish the levels were back to back. The Domino Row is definitely the better of the two, but it doesn't mean Big Board is a bad level by any means. These two levels split priorities between platforming and puzzles can be used as a great example to this game's entire gameplay thesis. I know that sounds like some quasi-intellect shit because I used a word like thesis, but this whole game is about blend- It's, a, it's about blend, blending puzzles and pla you're blending it together! You're blending puzzles and pla you're, you're blending it together! Another section of the game that echoes this back and forth balance between platforming and puzzles are the secret rooms, which can be accessed through these bright purple pipes scattered throughout the levels. These areas are completely optional and never have anything essential for completion in them, but they do contain a thousand points worth of treasure, which is a pretty damn substantial amount considering there are multiple in a level. If you're going for a score run in a stage, these are all but required to make sure you score as high as you can. A lot of these rooms revolve around throwing the professor here, since he's the only object in the game that has the properties of an enemy but can't be killed. Unlike the rocks or glass orbs you can find in these areas sometimes, the professor can be jumped on top of to gain extra height and can't die. He's indisposable, making him a great resource for the designers to use. Like I said before, they have a good reason for him being here too. He's an archaeologist researcher, so it would make sense he'd be exploring the pyramid simultaneously to Wario. Actually, now that I think of it, it's sort of a similar idea to the one I came up with in Virtual Boy Wario Land, where I said it'd be cool if a separate character was exploring the same setting at the same time as Wario. For that game though, it would work best if utilized for the boss fights and combat aspects, basically just giving Wario an adversary to butt heads with that isn't Mario. In this game though, all the characters inhabiting the same space as Wario are there for him to take advantage of in his own way. Whether that be abusing the professor to get around a secret room, or using the princess's services to get a leg up on bosses. I think that implicates a lot about Wario's character in a really subtle way, it's kinda cool. Back to these rooms though, I want a quick shot through some of my favorites to show off how they teeter back and forth between puzzles, platforming, or blending both. Let's cover some platforming ones first. Oh, uh, by the way, I wish these rooms had fucking names attached to them so I could refer to them accurately. I have to say, there's this one or in this room instead, which is gay. Anyway, there's this one where to get to the meat and potatoes of the room and reach the diamond at the end, you have to be in ball form. You need to be able to react to what's in front of you and jump to fill in the blocks to continue making progress through the room. It's a really simple challenge, but a really unique one at the same time. No other room in the game uses looping walls like this that I'm aware of, and I'm glad it was reserved for a rolling challenge. I also like that you can make your way to the diamond and miss some treasure that way if you don't explore all your options. There's a gap you can clear by jumping at the right time instead of filling in the blocks, which is fucking awesome too. I love having multiple solutions for easy challenges like that that I should just be able to recognize. There's another really cool one where the platforms above a spike pit are laid in front of you when standing on these green tiles, but 
get hidden as soon as you step off. It forces the player to recognize what they saw, and punishing them for rushing or forgetting by making them fall into spikes. If you're going for a score run in a level, it's pretty important you finish the level with full health, as each heart is worth more points at the results screen. Having a challenge room have imminent danger for messing up platforming makes this pretty engaging for the players who want to get as much points as they can. I like that for the first couple platforms here, the wall that appears in front of them signify the platform's locations accurately, but the last few don't work the same. It punishes you again for relying on the crutch instead of analyzing your surroundings. These two secret room challenges can be done pretty fast depending on how much you know about what you're getting into. There isn't any waiting around for something to trigger or happen unlike some of the puzzle-centric rooms. Often in rooms like this, it's waiting for the professor to walk somewhere for you to be able to use him. In this one though, you need to throw him into this pool of water so he'll sink to the bottom and trigger the switch to fill in the blocks you need to reach the diamond. The issue here though is that the platform you need to stand on before you jump up to the diamond is already filled in, meaning that when the professor triggers the switch, it'll disappear and you won't be able to reach the steps to the diamond. What you need to do is essentially race the sinking professor to the bottom of the room and jump at the right time to transfer platforms. If you're too slow to get to where you need to be, you won't even be able to jump up on the steps. If your reaction time on the jump between the two platforms is too slow, you'll miss your chance entirely. There's so many ways to mess up, and the thought process of the player might not even go towards throwing the professor in the water to begin with. On my initial playthrough, I tried to figure out if I could use the extra height I got from jumping on him to get to the diamond, but there's no way you'd be able to do that at all. There's only one solution. The fun of the game in these secret rooms more than half the time is figuring out what to do. It's that path optimization gameplay I was talking about earlier, but in the form of puzzle solving, and it's kinda cool. It's done really well, especially since there's seldom secret areas with multiple solutions. I know I just mentioned one with multiple solutions earlier, but that's the exception to the rule. It makes it so that when you do find one with multiple solutions, it's a pleasant surprise. I also like that they play with the properties of the professor as an object, which is evident especially in this room where you need to figure out you can throw him through spikes to get to the diamond. They even make use of the transformations in these areas, and they're honestly some of the best applications of them. There's a challenge room that has you forced to transform into Flat Wario to complete it, but you have to go slow and think carefully about where to throw this rock in the room with you in order to grant access to the diamond. It isn't particularly hard, but it is engaging, which is all these sections really need to be. The main challenge of the game comes from the levels themselves, so these act more like traditional bonus rooms if anything. You can even see them as a play on the treasure rooms from Wario Land 1 or Virtual Boy Wario Land. They grant you objects that add to your score, but make you work for them instead of granting you them for just finding the room. What's different about it in this game though is that these areas aren't particularly hard to get to or find half the time. Making the player work a bit to reap what's inside them makes sense. In the previous games, finding the room is the challenge, so the points are kind of like a gimme. In this one though, finding them is easy as fuck most of the time, so what's inside of them is the challenge, and I think that's cool. The only level I really want to talk about in the Sapphire Passage is Hotel Horror, but I honestly could talk about any of the levels in this world if I really wanted to, they're all great. Hotel Horror though is the only level in the game that really feels truly condensed, which makes sense because you're traveling inside a building. The architecture of the hotel you're in is completely squared off, but you can explore a bit of the outside stairwell too. The overall goal of the level is to travel around each floor of the hotel and make your way through each of its rooms either to progress or to up your score, but some of the rooms can be manipulated and changed based on your actions in other rooms. For example, passage to one room is locked behind these green blocks you can turn off, and once you do, you can access another section of the hotel you couldn't reach before. The boss tablets are a little hidden in plain sight in this level, but giving them to the player as a reward for exploring everything they can in the hotel works for a one-level deal. There's a lot going on in this stage to begin with, so much so that it's the only level with a map, so I don't really mind them not taking the time to meticulously hide the tablets like in other levels. As fitting of a setting a whorehouse is in Mario games for light puzzle solving, this level is actually more focused on platforming and maneuvering around than it is solving any difficult puzzles. There's a lot of memorizing what paths lead you to where in the hotel and how to platform around to get to where you need to be, which I guess could be considered the puzzle of the level, but there's a lot of just knowing where things are and how to get to them optimally anyway. I think this is actually the one level that used the most transformations at once. You have about four different times you need to use one here. You need to dodge the lights as Bat Wario to get higher up. You need to jump up accurately as Fire Wario to reach Keezer. There's also Zombie Wario and Fat Wario too. Zombie Wario shows up in a previous level, but it's used more as something you're meant to avoid rather than utilize the properties of. You can't get any lower or loop back around from the position you're in once you get to this point in the level, and the only way you can get back to the beginning, indie be -ling -ling. the only way you can get back to the beginning at that point is to use the zombie transformation to slip through the platforming blocking you from going any lower. Again, 
It's really simple, but it's pretty effective. And I wish I could say the same for Fat Wario here, though. There's a heavy block covering access to the frog switch here, and the only way you can break through it is to have the only enemy in the room transform you. This is kind of fucking stupid, though, because the same result could have been achieved if you just put a set of platforms here for me to jump on top with and allow me to ground pound through. As it is, the enemy is seemingly only here so they could fit another transformation in the level, but it's actually slower than if they were to just give me the height to ground pound through. The enemy being the solution to this room doesn't require any more critical thinking on part of the player, and it's just an overall clunkier potential solution to a progression gate that could have been easily circumvented if they just let me maintain flow and ground pound through the block! It's a puzzle I would expect from the likes of Wario Land 3, but not this game. That's why I'm upset. You could have done something a lot more interesting with, like, Flat Wario. Hell, you could have stripped it straight from Wario Land 2 if you were so insistent on using a similar puzzle. It would even work a lot better in this game since the physics of Flat Wario are way better. Anyway, it fucking sucks, whatever. Hitting the frog switch in this level poses an interesting challenge to the player to recall where each room leads all the way back to the beginning, but backwards. It's in contrast to most of the other levels where you can just leisurely rush your way back the way you came. It also helps there's a couple ways to do this, either by darting around rooms that'll take you back to the ground floor, or going outside of the stairwell and falling through as a zombie, perching you right next to the vortex. If you care at all about the secret CDs you can get, though, you can find the red door that opens upon pressing the frog switch and take on the challenge inside of it. Not only do you get to nab the CD, but you also get a shortcut to the bottom floor. It's one of the only levels in this game with so many ways to return to the entrance, and it might be even better if the timer wasn't eight years long, making it one of the easiest escape sequences in the game. This level isn't the best in the Sapphire Passage at all, but it definitely has a lot going for it and against it, which makes it a more interesting discussion than other levels. I also had to restrain myself from picking the Arabian Nights level, at risk of making more secret rings comparisons! I don't have a lot to say about the levels in the Ruby Passage. They weren't my favorite to play, but they all had something cool about them at the same time. Curious Factory is too short and doesn't take advantage of Flat Wario enough. It mostly uses him to cross one block wide gaps under ceilings that normal Wario can't instead of using his fall arc. It also does that shit that some games do where the camera has to follow you 100% of the time. So when you make a jump, it pans up to keep you in frame, but obscures the platform you were aiming for in the first place. Jesus Christ, I mean, we figure this shit out by now, right? This is mostly a problem in like shovelware or like older games, but on the Game Boy Advance? I mean, I guess the screen is really small, but god damn, man, we got a game like Attack of the Rhinox on here. You'd think a game like that with a kind of overhead camera would be really horrible on a small ass handheld, especially with how close it is to Spyro, but it works perfectly. There isn't a single time the camera is blocking something important. It keeps everything within the player's immediate vision all at once. No matter how small the screen is, there's no reason these platforms in this level couldn't have been shaped up to avoid this. There isn't a single other part in Wario Land 4 like this too, which makes it even worse. Maybe Attack of the Rhinox isn't the best comparison to go with here considering the difference in how these two games cameras function, but they're occupying the same space on the screen so that shouldn't even matter. This whole leap of faith shit in games is infuriating. This is the kind of shit Braid makes fun of. Um, then again, the whole game's a joke, so... It looked like Mario in the future. The level sort of makes up for it by having some of my favorite secret rooms in the game, and it also has that really cool robot background I talked about earlier. So, you know, whatever, it's alright. Toxic Landfill has a bunch of rooms with nothing but destructible blocks in it. It made me think there was a bonus room hidden behind some of them, but there never was. It's really strange, there's literally no reason for there to be so many empty rooms designed like this, but they did it anyway. It's uncharacteristically lazy of this game, which is really disappointing. It's graphically one of my favorites in the game though, and even if it's lazy to just have a bunch of destructibles in the way for no reason, it is satisfying to plow through them. I guess they were meaning for Wario to be like a sort of compactor for the trash here, just leveling all this garbage to get through, which is kinda cool. So, you know, it's alright. 40 Below Fridge is the most soundly designed of the three mentioned so far, but it's way too long, and the process of figuring out how to use Snowball Wario to progress throughout the level isn't satisfying. This is mostly due in part to the level's confusing layout not prioritizing guiding the player, which is kind of important when designing a level where progression is meant to be blocked off, but it isn't so bad on repeated playthroughs. It's really only annoying on your first pass. With all this in mind, you'd think Ruby Passage would be the most okay part of the game, but fuck you, this world has the pinball level, it's fucking great! Hmm, pinball! It's not even the best level in the game, but it's just good enough to where it makes me look back at the levels that come before it to note things more positively about them. The entire level takes place in a pinball machine, and it's one of the only levels in the game that has a massive focus on throwing things and other more underused states like climbing. I know I've really been going on and on and on about how this game fuses jumping around and puzzles, but this level is the most standout example of this. You're supposed to take these pinballs and throw them into all the compartments to open the path to the next room, but 
Sometimes they're hidden in obtuse places you need to figure out how to get to. Wario has a lot of properties attached to each of his moves that go without focus within the design of the stages, and I feel like this level was meant to circumvent that. Like I said before, there's a bunch of climbing sections, but you can also make stationary objects bounce with his ground pound, either bouncing them to where they need to be or towards him to grab, which is basically what this whole level is. Between each room that houses pinballs, you need to travel through an in-between section, connecting the main rooms together. Often in these rooms, you need to roll into a ball to pass through, like a pinball, and I really like that attention to detail. I kind of think they don't go far enough with it though, to be honest. It would be really cool if there were paddles you could fall onto in these rooms that keep you in ball form. You gotta like push the jump button to have it fling you, it's like Sonic 2. There aren't a lot of levels in this game that require you to throw objects, except for like the bosses, which is weird considering it's such a selling point and integral feature of Wario's moveset. But having a level focus entirely on that aspect of Wario, while also melding exploration around and figuring out what makes each area crack with no transformation bullshit, is really fucking refreshing. It's great, I love it. This was the last level I played in the game before I went on to the final area, so it made it really memorable for me. It's also probably my absolute favorite looking level in the game. I fucking love the art of all the creatures and like robots on the wall, cool text graphics everywhere. It makes me want to see a real pinball machine with this aesthetic, instead of the, you know, like usual dumb neon carny bullshit you see. It's an awesome level, which is funny considering how much I don't give a fuck about pinball. Have you seen these fucking stupid pinball machine games? Not like fucking like Space Cadet, I mean like new shit. I never knew this was a thing until I saw it on my Switch for like a dollar, but there's like this weird subsect of like crossover pinball games where you can listen to like Bob's Burgers audio while you play pinball. Uh... Hey, did you know the same artist behind Bob's Burgers did Sanjay and Craig? I bet you did! Pinball isn't even that fun digitally. Fucking let alone in real life. Isn't the fun of pinball in real life shaking the fuck out of the machine to keep going even if you think you'll fuck up? What good is having a shake feature in my pinball game if all it takes is pushing R2? I'm a scrawny fuck, so I can't even manage to shake a machine even slightly to reap good results. The last time I did that was with a vending machine when my hot Cheetos got stuck. It takes fucking zero brain power for me to push a button to accomplish the same task on a controller. And you know, I always turn off Sonic Adventure at that pinball part. And there's all these fucking useless pinball games from all these different companies. They're all basically the same game with a different coat of paint. And all I'm really doing is watching a ball bounce back and forth. This doesn't give me the same kind of dopamine I did watching the same thing happen on the basketball court. So you know what? I think I actually hate this level now. Pinball's fucking stupid. All in all, the quality of all the levels are sort of all over the place, but it isn't so bad since the way the game's structured just allows you to move on to another level if you aren't feeling the one you're currently on. It also helps that Wario is so fun to play as in this game. Like 75% of the fun factor in this game comes from how good it feels to shoulder bash shit and run around as this top cat fuck. Additionally, I have a feeling the structure of the world map and how it works came after the designing phase of the levels. They probably had them all done and laid out and maybe felt it would be rough on the player to force them through each level if they didn't like just one. It makes more sense to give the player as many options as they could so they didn't risk people dropping the game, which would be especially embarrassing because it's so short. Subtract my own empty-headedness from the equation and you can definitely beat this in like 6 hours, but that's not really a bad thing. My favorite kinds of games are bite-sized experiences like this. They're really replayable and easy to squeeze out all you like about them. Honestly, if it were any longer, like if there was like an extra world or something, I might call this game a drag, but as it is, it's kind of the perfect length. But I'm not done talking about this game yet, because I haven't even gotten to the best part! The BOSSES! Wario Land 4 has six bosses in total. As I've said a million times before, this game was directed by Matsuoka, so you'd think the bosses would lean towards functioning like they did in Virtual Boy Wario Land. What ends up actually happening though is they go for a mixture of how they worked in that game and the original. It's like they took a look at how all the bosses worked in all the previous games and just took the best bits of what was there and left out anything else. They really learned their lesson from Wario Land 2 and 3. And by that I mean to say they took nothing from how those bosses work because they suck. In Wario Land 1, 2, and 3 you would face bosses at the end of levels or during the middle of levels, but like Virtual Boy Wario Land, Wario Land 4 puts bosses in their own dedicated levels. They take up a level slot in the world, but are nothing more than an arena for you to fight in. The bosses in Virtual Boy Wario Land are programmed in strict cycles, making it really obtuse to extend your advantage in the fight. I mean, it's definitely possible, but whenever you can do it, it doesn't feel intentional. Like, it feels like an oversight that the boss's hurt box was still active whenever you could hit them more than once in a cycle. This is the opposite of Wario Land 1, where the bosses were strictly designed to capitalize on what you knew about them and how many hits you can get in based on that. 
This is the kind of boss design Wario Land 4 evolves on, but in the way where it blends both what the Virtual Boy game offered and the original. If Wario Land 1 is focused on giving the player control of the fight, Virtual Boy is focused on giving the boss control, and Wario Land 2 and 3 are too busy eating pace, Wario Land 4 has all it needs to split the control perfectly. They blended the two together in a really smart way. On a first time playthrough of a boss, both the player and the boss are at an equal advantage. Advantages are swayed to each party based on what the player knows about what they're meant to do, what moves to use to damage the boss, where to hit the boss, etc, etc. You're never at an initial disadvantage with a boss on a blind run since every boss's beginning phases are within comfortable parameters. This is obvious shit, but none of them have like one hit kill moves they can use on you or anything. Anyway, your task in a boss is to always find their weak point and how to hit it. Once you figure that out, you're now an advantage and can start trying to hit the boss. After you've gotten a hit on them, they attempt to take the advantage from you by starting their turn to attack. And then, you know, you gotta like, push the buttons on the controller to not get hit and shit, you know. Now, usually on your first time through, you take the hit you got on the boss as a win and assume you can't extend further than that. You'd just try to get as many one hits as you can until the boss is over, and you can totally do that in this game and be fine. What you'll soon end up realizing though is that every boss is set up so their weak point is still immediately vulnerable after your first hit, meaning if you're quick enough you can repeat the same action and hit them again. It's all about optimizing your movement so that you can reset the boss into their getting hurt animation over and over after hitting them. It's entirely possible, and in all but one case, definitely intentional. If you do it perfectly, you can repeat this process over and over and catch the boss in a loop where you refuse to let them finish their animation. The reason you'd want to do this is because if they finish their animation at all, they now have their turn to attack in control of the pace, which sucks for you. The only bosses this doesn't apply to are Kumar Condor over here and the final boss, but they still sort of fall under the same umbrella, which we'll get into in a bit. The bosses in this game have a lot of replayability with all this in mind, which goes hand in hand with the rest of the game's replayable aspects. You can one cycle every boss without ever getting hit or getting put in disadvantage, but again, it's fucking hard, even if you're not trying to game the system and just play the boss normally. What makes this idea so important, and the boss is even harder, is that all of them are on a time limit. The more time you take to kill a boss, the less treasure you'll get for beating them, which means a worse ending. And you want the good ending, okay? This time limit not only forces the player to work under a tense environment, but also encourages them to take advantage of the boss in any way they can, whether it be through extending their hits or using the item shop. Before every boss, you can enter this item shop run by Shakura and buy shit that'll damage the boss for you at the beginning of the fight. They all have fun little animations too, which is a nice touch. You can also buy a free smile! It's completely up to the player whether or not they want to use any of these items in the first place, which is really cool, it's another risk versus reward thing. Not buying an item rewards you with the satisfaction that you did it without any extra help or a crutch, but that in turn puts the player at risk of losing treasure for taking too long. What's a little unfortunate about these items though is that some of them completely trivialize these fights. Each item does a specific amount of damage on each boss, and if you just happen to buy one that does the most amount of damage on the boss you're about to face, it can completely ruin any challenge that comes from the fight. Like Black Dog does 10 points of damage to Catbat, and it puts him down to like 2 bits of health. It makes the fight a complete waste. I don't know why they implemented these super damaging items at all, especially since the rest of the items only do like 2 to 5 damage per boss, which is completely reasonable. It makes more sense from a designer's aspect not to include items that'll basically beat the boss for you, right? Like, you put all this work into programming these boss patterns and making assets for them, so it seems weird to develop a system around allowing the player to completely avoid experiencing them. But, I don't fucking know, I'm not a game designer. <laughs> anyway, it's a little weird you can't buy these items with the treasure you get in gameplay now that I think about it. It would give the treasure a pretty practical usage. You could even sort of develop a weird economy between how expensive each item is, how much you want to spend your treasure, and how much treasure there are in levels to begin with. I think that could work really well with the kind of games the Wario Land series is. It would be like an alternative to the gambling minigames from the original. This game doesn't have lives, so implementing a similar system where instead of spending treasure on life security, you spend it on an easier time on bosses is cool. And you know what? Giving the player the option to make the game easier at the cost of a possible worse ending is super cool! The only problem with this is that the treasure is almost exclusively used for the score of levels. It doesn't even affect the ending you get at all. The ending is affected only by the amount of chests you get after defeating a boss and has nothing to do with the total amount of treasure you've collected between levels, which is weird, especially since there's already a counter for that shit. Yeah, you spend treasure to play mini games in this game, which in turn gives you coins to buy the items at the shop. So strange, why not just cut out the middleman? And honestly, I don't know, like, these little WarioWare games kinda suck. 
Like, it's a cool idea to play little micro games to earn currency to help you with the boss, but there's literally nothing correlating the two. The games have nothing to do with the boss, and the boss has nothing to do with the games. They don't even affect each other in any way, not even thematically. It works as a fun sort of prototype to WarioWare, but if they were so adamant about not spending the treasure you get in levels, why not design a way to get currency that trains you in the same skills you would use in the boss fights? I'm imagining some sort of Kirby True Arena thing. Maybe you have to fight a bunch of waves of enemies or unique mini-bosses that the more you go through, the more money you get to use in the shop or something. It would make sense to have the player practice their offensive options and pattern recognition skills in a mode like this, while also rewarding them with a way to take less time on the bosses, but maybe that's counterintuitive. The only alternative I can think of is being rewarded items that make the fights harder but give more treasure or something, but that would only work if the treasure contributed to the ending you get. I don't know, the minigames themselves are also pretty boring to play. The only one that's really any fun is Wario Roulette, but that's only because you can make Wario Burris in it. <laughs> Wario Hop is fucking weird also. I feel like the hitbox on the wheel is like fucked up or something, because I can never get past the part where you're supposed to jump over the professor. I think implementing something where currency is gained through the main gameplay style would just be a lot more fun in general too, because duh, the best parts of this game are where you get to play as Wario. As it is, it's just kind of here as a fun side thing, but attaching it to such an integral mechanic feels weird. There's no reason you can just find the currency in the levels hidden away or something too, but it's fine, whatever. Back on the actual bosses, the Emerald Passage boss, Cractus, might be my favorite in the game. He perfectly shows off that balancing act between keeping yourself an advantage to extend how much damage you can do and how devastating it can be to give the boss a chance. His advantage state has him rolling through three different attacks, and getting hit by one of them can make his turn even longer, costing you almost 30 seconds in a 4 minute battle. Normally something like this would be a huge arbitrary annoyance, but since the whole game of Wario Land 4's bosses is being as efficient as you can be, punishment for fucking up being wasting your time actually makes sense for once. Eat my shit, Wario Land 3! Bombs away, boys, bitch! Touching the jewel that drips from Cractus's mouth in this fight turns Wario into a useless zombie. A firefly will buzz on a screen that'll let you transform back if you catch it, but if you freak out and don't assess the situation quick enough, it's likely you'll be too slow to get to it. He'll fly away off screen, meaning you have to wait for him again, obviously wasting more time. Wasting more time means having less opportunities to hit the boss, and having less opportunities to hit the boss means you might not beat him fast enough to get all three chests. All this will only happen if you get hit by the drool. The cool thing about this fight though is that overextending your hits, as difficult as it is, puts you at a higher risk of getting hit by the drool than just getting one hit on him would. Every aspect of this fight directly plays on each other to make messing up a tension increase, and these bosses are already tense as is with their difficulty and timer. The risk reward attribute of extending how much damage you can do is great here too. You definitely want to do as much damage as quick as you can, maybe even try to get the boss in a loop, but if you make the slightest misinput or time something off, you'll fight right- you'll, you'll, you'll fight a boss again, you'll fight two bosses. It's up to the player to know their limits on what they can do so they don't waste any more time than they need to risking a worse chess pool. The optimized version of this boss makes it look like a joke, but it's ridiculously hard. Not only do you have to space yourself to where you won't miss your ground pound, still hit his head, and not fall into the path of his drool, but also time your initial hit so he rises at a distance where it's possible to reach him from the ladder. It's borderline pixel perfect, but damn, it's such a good challenge. I can only hit him twice, maybe three times on a single cycle, and even then I used Visor Man for this fight so he had way less health. Even despite that though, I almost didn't beat it on my first go. I let him hit me way too many times on his last hit, and we both ended up with one more bit of health left on us, raising the tension even higher. I was also like a minute away from losing a treasure, which would have sucked because I want a good ending, okay? This boss is great. I might even say it's my favorite in the series next to the final boss in the original game. It's a super tough and memorable challenge, which is all it really needs to be. In fact, all these bosses are memorable in some way, whether it be through their design or the way you fight them. Like for example, the Topaz Passage boss, Aerodent. His design isn't anything too interesting, he's just a flying teddy bear being controlled by a mouse, and to be honest, he isn't really even that great of a fight, but he's probably the easiest boss to extend on, which is really satisfying to do right. His whole thing is wasting your time because you're only able to hit him when he lets you, so honestly, if you don't extend at least once or twice, you might not get all the chests without using an item. Once you flip him over and the little mouse pops out of his head, you can shoulder bash his head over and over if you time it right so he never flies back up to the top of the screen. It's really satisfying to do all in one go, but Messing up makes the boss way harder since past a certain damage threshold, you'll start throwing fire on the ground where you need to be to hit him, which transforms you. If you don't capitalize and one cycle him, you're gonna end up wasting a ton of time trying to finagle a hit on him, which maybe isn't very fun, but it is satisfying to conquer if it gets to that. With the Ruby Passage boss, Kaku Condor, you need to get him in his second phase so he can give you an alternative way to hit him now that you broke his armor. 
He does this by supplying you with eggs that you can catch and throw upwards onto the tip of his head to deal damage, but if you miss the catch on the egg, it'll hatch onto the ground as a little chick you need to deal with. Killing the chick with a shoulder bash will give Condor just enough time to hatch another egg you need to catch, but since you're likely dealing with the chick on the other side of the screen, it has a high chance of landing on the ground. If this cycle repeats, the floor will quickly get filled with chicks, and it'll be really hard for you to position yourself in a way where you can catch the eggs to throw them back. It can get really overwhelming really fast, but if you run out of time on this boss and obtain the hindsight for the next try, it's all just a matter of catching every egg he throws at you. Jesus, I sound like a fucking GameFAQs guy. <laughs> when I say this boss functions differently than the others, I mean that you're not really taking advantage of his animations to extend your hits, but rather playing to his actions to hit him consistently. There is no loop to pull off on this boss, it's mostly just making sure no eggs hit the floor so you have less trouble to deal with, which is completely dependent on the player's skill. The more trouble there is to deal with, the more likely you are to miss a hit, and the more likely you are to miss a hit, the more you waste time, you get it. I think it's cool because the rate at which Condor spits out eggs is set, it never speeds up or slow down to trip you up, it's static. It's all up to whether or not you can maintain that pace, which is a cool way of designing an alternatively functioning boss in a game like this. The final boss works the same way. During the first phases, the diva will throw things at you that you need to throw back to deal damage. Some of the things she throws won't hurt her just by being thrown and can't even be picked up to throw back. Like she'll throw a hammer that won't do anything when thrown back at her, so you need to throw it up and hit yourself with it to turn into a spring to hit her. Or she'll throw a heavy ball you need to shoulder bash that'll bounce off the walls and hit her at an angle. I like that you can take something she throws at you and use it to get rid of another thing she sent out. It gives the player the option to ease their ground if they're getting overwhelmed, but wastes time overall. The boss is all about, again, consistently keeping up with the rate at which she tosses shit at you, but also being able to react to what she's throwing at you to hurt her in a timely fashion. What's cool about her boss specifically is that all the chests you've gotten thus far are on the line here, so it can be pretty stressful to see a full wall of chests up for loss. It's a really cool way to evolve the tension. Her last phase is also cool. You finally unmask her and she gets enraged and will start destroying the ground where you stand and attempts to hit you. It took me a second to realize what to do and I fucking sat up in my chair to figure it out. It made my heart sink. The only really unfortunate thing about these two bosses is that there's a ton of hair on my mic. <laughs> God. They're kind of piss easy since there's only one thing that makes them crack. Unlike Cractus, where the game is asking a lot of you, or Aerodent, where one mess up wastes a ton of time. They're fine bosses, but honestly I felt a little underwhelmed by the diva fight. It felt too short in a way, like not extravagant enough compared to everything you did to get to this point. I really do like that you have to transform yourself to hit her though, and I'll admit it is really satisfying to punch her lips with a shoulder bash to end the game. So yeah, even the bosses that don't have the same challenge to most of them offer a valid enough alternative under the same design idea. The only boss I can say for a fact doesn't do any of this is Catbat. Catbat isn't a bad boss or anything, if anything he's just a bit boring, but they had a perfectly good opportunity to make him function like the other bosses, but I don't know, something went wrong. He looks great, I love his design and sprite work a ton, but his fight is definitely the most undercooked in the game. You're meant to shoulder bash jump off these waves he sends to hit the top of his head, and you'd think you'd be able to return to the wave quick enough to hit him again before he does another attack, but no. The waves travel across the screen too fast to be able to have the same angle on your shoulder bash jump to hit him again. You can hit him earlier than intended by shoulder bash jumping as he goes down to make a wave, but the timing is pretty strict. Once you hit him enough times to get rid of the bat on his head, you're meant to ground pound his head as he comes by, but you can just jump on his head as soon as it happens and push him into a corner. Then you just gotta keep ground pounding until he dies, it's really weird. It's the only one that doesn't feel intentional, and I guess that might be because of how easy it is to pull off? I don't know. It doesn't seem like the way they wanted you to do this compared to like, practice. I know I've been describing fucking speedrunner tier tricks this whole time, but all of this tech is completely within the capability of someone who's played the game at least once before, the skill gap isn't so huge. This cat bat fight definitely feels like an exploit compared to the rest of the bosses, but maybe if you can do it at all, it was intended. Even though some of the bosses aren't as good as others, their highest highs trump the highs of the previous games, and they never dip as low as the lowest lows of the previous games. They're definitely my preferred bosses in the whole series. There's just a couple of things surrounding them, like the whole boss item system or the way the endings work. I think they could have revised to make everything about them perfect. As they are though, they're fun as fuck to play and get better at, which is all you could really ask for for bosses and your platformer on the Game Boy! This is all to say that this game is definitely the best in the series, which isn't a surprise at all. It's no wonder people tout this as one of the best Nintendo games, because it's definitely a contender. It evolves on all the previous games in clever ways that solidify those games as stepping stones to a peak in the series. It has a progressed version of Wario Land 1's movement and bosses, Virtual Boy Wario Land's split exploration and platforming natures expanded upon, and all the transformations in 2 and 3 are improved through the engine of the game. You know, 
It's no Sute Hakun though, so Wario Land 4 is far from perfect, but there's a lot here that makes up for that at the same time. I wish some of the levels were better, but the good ones outweigh the bad ones. I wish there was more reason for the side modes existing, but they're not necessary for completion, so you can avoid them. I wish some of the moveset was better utilized consistently, but Wario's fun to play as regardless. This game isn't unpolished by any means, but I think an extra layer of polish would do this game a lot of good. I'm only looking at this under such an intense magnifying glass compared to the other games because it's so good and because it does so much right. It isn't like the other games where there's something fundamentally wrong with the way they're structured like in 2 and 3 that almost dissolve them of this kind of standard. A lot of this doesn't matter though since Wario is just so fun to play as, which was the most important thing to get right. Speaking of the previous entries, it turns out all of the previous directors had some developmental correlation to this game. Kiyotake and Hosokawa acted as additional designers, meaning this is the last time that all three previous Wario directors would work on a game together. In fact, this game acts as their last prominent developmental role in any Nintendo game. They shifted towards being supervisors, artists, or just straight up dropped out of the industry entirely after this game in WarioWare. The most disappointing of the bunch being Matsuoka's departure in my opinion. He officially left the company in 2005 but would continue working with Nintendo up until 2018 on useless shit like personal trainer walking or detective fucking Pikachu. It's weird to think about really. He'd been working at the company since it started and his earliest works include huge games like the original Metroid, Balloon Fight, and Kid Icarus. To think this guy who has all these credits on these classic games has no hand in anything recent going on in the company and was stuck making these stupid games no one talks about outside of the novelty of them in his late years is a bit upsetting. But I don't know, maybe it was relaxing for the guy to not have to worry about making these big groundbreaking games anymore. He probably had fun designing personal trainer walking for all I know, it's definitely got that old Nintendo charm to it. I was reading an interview with Matsuoka on Wario Land 4 and he said his interpretation of Wario is that of a dedicated treasure hunter. I feel like this is kind of the end of that era in a way. A disregarding Shake It, every inclusion of Wario after this point has him taking the role of a grotesque tycoon who like farts or something. In any case, they all really went out working together with like a bang or like a like a boom. Uh, they did a good job. This game's great and it's definitely worth your time. It was the last Wario Land game for a while and it took them like seven years to make a new one and it ended up just being okay. It's mediocre. Mediocre?